Okay, everybody, now is when we pull it all together. We are going to solve for extent of reaction given a certain Ka. All right, so let's remind ourselves what Xi, or extent of, or not extent of reaction, reaction coordinate, uh, or squiggle, uh, what that was. So this is the one um, variable, and it has units of moles that we can use to uh, turn everything that's happening about a reaction into a one equation, one unknown sort of scenario. So the number of moles uh, at as the number of moles of I as the reaction proceeds is equal to the number of moles you started out with times C times uh, the stoichiometric coefficient. So let's do a super quick little example to remind us of this. Let's say we have a reactor and we have put this many moles of A, B, and C into it. All right, and we want to uh, write an expression for how many moles of each there are. So N A, let's see, we started with one mole. Um, its stoichiometric coefficient is negative one. And uh, so it's one minus C is how many moles there are as the reaction goes on. Uh, two B started with two moles. Uh, it's stoichiometric coefficients also, negative one. So that's what we have there. And then C started with four moles uh, and its stoichiometric coefficient is positive two. Uh, and if we look at that all together, our total number of moles in the system at any given time is four plus two plus one, seven. Um, and then uh, it's a plus two and a minus two. <laughs> I picked a great example. So it's a, it's a seven plus a zero C. <laughs> the number of moles in the system is always seven, basically. All right, so if we had to write the expression for the mole fraction, yeah, this is where this is going, people. Uh, so the mole fraction, you will recall, is defined as the number of moles of thing, of interest, divided by the total number of moles in the system. So in the case of the system we've got going on here, we have uh, y of a is equal to one minus c divided by seven, okay? Easy enough. And so you could write an expression, a similar expression for the number of moles of b and for the number of moles of c, right? You might wanna hit pause right now and write those out just to get a little bit of practice on this because we're gonna dive into our real problem in just a second. Okay, as promised, here's our real problem. So once again, this reaction, which I swear to you is industrially re relevant, really. Um, we have water and methane, and we're gonna run this reaction in such a way that we get hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So what are we initially going to put in the reactor? Let's initially say uh, we have one mole of methane. That tends to be the expensive part, although right now methane's really pretty cheap. Um, and then we have a bunch of steam. And often we can use excess steam. So I'm going to say we're going to start with five moles uh, of steam, one mole of methane. And then just so... Uh, the, the math is sufficiently complex. Let's say we have a little bit of both hydrogen and carbon monoxide left in our uh, reaction vessel such that uh, that's there as we go. Okay, so hit pause. Do this ahead of me. Write out uh, the expressions for the number of moles of each of these. Okay, hope your answers match mine. Here's, here's what I got. And so, do you see where this is going? I'm gonna be asking you on the next page to go ahead and write y for each element. Actually, I'm gonna ask you to do it here on this page, because why not? Um, so go ahead and again, hit pause, write out all of those y's. Make sure you know how to do it. Don't just keep playing and let me make them magically appear.
Alrighty, here they all are. Do you agree? I hope you agree, or at least I hope I did it right and that we all agree together. So now we are going to pull it all together and do some solving. Let's go. All right. So we have at a temperature of 298K, you previously worked out delta G. You know the temperature. You know R. Um, watch units. Why do I say watch units? Because delta G is often in kilojoules per mole, whereas R, if you use 8.314, that's in joules per mole K. So uh, not only does this temperature have to be in K, but you need to pay extra attention to the fact that this is a joule and this is a kilojoule and throw a conversion factor in there at some point. Otherwise, your answers are going to be silly. Also, don't forget the negative sign. Okay, so that, this all is what's on the right-hand side of this equation, and that's equal to K. And if we are assuming ideal gas, that means we get to write this expression for what K is equal to, right? So K is going to be um, our y's all times each other than times pressure squared. And you'll notice there's a little three up here because it's h uh, uh, y raised to the new. So since uh, CH4, its uh, stoichiometric coefficient is negative one, something raised to the negative one power is sitting on the bottom of a fraction whereas something raised to the 1 is sitting on top, and uh, h2 is cubed. Okay, so now what the heck are we going to do with this? Well, here we go. Step 1, uh, we find delta G at temperature. Step 2, use to calc. Ka, so we get a numerical value for Ka. Step three, use C to write expressions for Y or X for make assumptions so often ideal gas, ideal solution, are the assumptions. Five, plug in y's or x's and solve. And you, you're saying to yourself, what? Vijay, what do you mean solve? And they're like, look back up here. If you plug in the expressions you got on the last page for yh2, yco, yh2o, ych4, you find that this whole thing right here this whole equation is one equation, one unknown. Excuse me. Your unknown is C, and that's the, uh, that's the equation. So you can solve this for C, and then you will know at equilibrium, you'll know uh, the composition of your reaction. And that's super important. And then... Remember this, we did reaction energy balances way back in January. Once you know C, you can also do the energy balance. So how much energy was liberated by this reaction or used by this reaction now that you know C. So <coughs> this is uh, huge and this is the next step. Um, I like to use, uh, you can do this old school with actual algebra and just move stuff around. Uh, you can do this in your calculator. Your calculator is absolutely okay with one equation and one unknown. Note that this equation up here uh, has, a, has a cube in it, so we might have multiple roots. Usually only one of them is a realistic answer, and the other ones are things like negative numbers that make no sense physically. So there's only ever one answer that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I like to use Excel. And I like to use Excel not because Excel is actually good at this, it's crappy at this, but Excel gives me lots of space to write out this equation 
um, whereas my calculator does not. In my calculator, I, I don't, um, I have to type it exactly right and get all the parentheses right. I have to do it all in one go. Whereas in Excel, I write one cell that has each Y in it, and they all refer to the same cell that has C in it. I have another cell that's got KA written in terms of all the Ys, and then I've got a cell that's got the uh, geo exponent of G over RT, and I can goal seek by changing C uh, until the Ks come out even. And that's how I prefer to do it. And you may as well do it that way too now because you know we're always gonna be using computers from here on out in this class. So what you are gonna do now is you're gonna try solving this. Uh, and then we've gotta have a conversation about what solving it means, okay? Um, there are two common cases where you don't have to actually go to the trouble of using Excel or even your calculator. Um, one of those cases is where Ka is huge, okay? Uh, when Ka is huge, that means C goes to C max. Remember, we used to work out what the maximum C would be. Um, usually, that means the limiting reagent is completely consumed. Uh, the reaction proceeds all the way towards the products. Um, and you say, well, what's our definition of huge? And I say huge is something times 10, say 10 to the fifth and up. I'm going to call that huge here, okay? Um, maybe, yeah, yeah, 10 to the fifth and oh, well, here, I'm going to change it actually. I'm going to make it 10 to the tenth. 10 to the tenth and up is definitively huge. Okay, what about tiny? What the heck are we going to do with tiny? Well, tiny is to be like 10 to the negative 10th and down. Note that it's never a negative number. If you get a negative number, something really weird happened in your math. Um, negative numbers are not okay. They're just very, very close to zero. Um, and something that's very popular is you might say, well, wait, uh, if, if uh, Ka comes out really, really, really small, like very close to zero, uh, then I know uh, that the reaction doesn't proceed at all. No, wrong answer. If it comes out very, very close to zero, it means the reaction uh, favors the reactants. Um, it means the reaction runs backwards. So C, you can just write down that C is equal to C minimum. So uh, in the case of our example, I expect that you will determine that this reaction runs all the way backwards. That's what you're gonna find out, okay? So, but I want you to do it. So that is the thing you should do. Um, if it is not a really huge number or a really tiny number, then you've got to actually suck it up and do the algebra. But uh, between these two, you don't have to do the algebra. You could just look at it and say, yeah, I'm done, right? So I want you right now to work through what is the answer. So for our example, what is C? What is N for each species after the reaction? And when I say our example, I mean the water gas shift, the syn gas reaction. So go ahead, work that out, enter that in, and I'll see you all later.